I'm Maurice Vanderpoel, and I'm going to tell you my story. I was born in the Netherlands, in the city of Amsterdam, and want to say a few things about my family. I'm Jewish, my family was Jewish, and had lived, most of my extended families had lived in Amsterdam for at least 200 years, as far as I could make out from the records, historical records. Uh, and Jews in the Netherlands were equal with all other citizens, were never persecuted. So we were used to live in a free country, a democracy, a monarchy, but a monarchy that has, in this case, has had a queen when I was born and lived during the Holocaust. We had a queen, Queen Wilhelmina, but the queen was considered like the mother of the country. And whenever there was trouble anywhere, serious trouble, she would be there to help, console. She had no formal power except by virtue of her personality. Uh, the country is a, was and is a democracy with a parliament, and that's where the power of government lies. We had moved, or my parents had moved from the inner city where there was a Jewish neighborhood that had existed for hundreds of years, uh, where Jews chose to live. They were not forced to live in any particular place, but that was a community. My parents moved out of that community with the notion that they wanted to better the economic possibilities, and particularly that my brother and I would have a good education, which we did have. There was no, se no sense of uh, you're Jewish or you're not Jewish. If you liked somebody, you became friends. And so I had some good friends. I went to public school and we lived in the Netherlands where we had not been in any war for at least a hundred years. We were not in World War I. So we knew peace, and as a people, I think we were sort of uh, used like that's how it's supposed to be, that there is peace, uh, and that you do the best you can. And there were very little, uh, there was very little evidence of any serious troubles. So this is how life was supposed to be. On the 10th of May, 1940, we were awakened during the night by um, sirens that indicated that there was something going on with airplanes coming in that were not ours, that were hostile. My father, who was a diamond merchant, traveled every week from Monday afternoon till Friday afternoon away to Antwerp, where the diamond trade had moved from Amsterdam. So we did not see him during the week, and he was supposed to return on Friday. Mm. This night was the night from Wednesday up, up into Thursday. At 3 a.m. we were awakened. We turned on the radio and heard that the Germans had invaded our country by air and by land. And we heard the uh, anti-aircraft guns shooting, heard bullets or ammunition falling down in the streets, sometimes coming through the windows or even through the walls. And we were told on the radio to sit on the stairs in the center of the house for safety. All this, you can imagine, was 
a very strange experience. A total surprise, shocking surprise. On the third day of this new war, our queen left the country. As I mentioned, the queen was like a mother, and it was this case like a mother leaving her family. And my wife told me that when this happened, he was listening to the ra her father was listening to the radio, and when he heard it, he smashed the radio and started crying. She had never seen her father cry before, or since for that matter. So there we were, my father was gone, my mother, my brother, and I, and my grandfather. On the fourth day, the Germans bombed the city of Rotterdam, and the whole center of the city was bombed out in a few hours. Big city. I went to see it later and cried my eyes out because what I saw of families who had lived there in ruins was more than I could take. On the fifth day, the Dutch army's military surrendered and the Germans came marching in with their goose step, their nailed boots, and they didn't find much sympathy on the part of the Dutch people. They were singing those military songs that we never did and uh, hated every minute of it and didn't know what we were going to do next. And then silence. Nothing seemed to be happening except for the fact that they appointed a new government, a German-run government, with a, Nazi, a prominent Nazi in charge. His name was Dr. Seiss Inquart. And he limped when he walked. And so we imitated him, I mean, made fun of him by walking around like a limp, uh, with a limp and the Hitler salute. That's how we imitated him. It may sound very poor taste, but for us it was a relief. Humor, as I will come back to later, was a relief, a very important relief in a terrible situation. And then there was nothing. I started medical school <clears throat> in August, and um, everything was just fine and dandy, except we didn't know where my father was. It turned out he had fled to France. He couldn't back, come back to Holland, got back to Holland because of the, the war front. And he ended up in the unoccupied part of southern France. In February of uh, 41, it was all of a sudden announced that uh, all Jewish students had to leave the university. And there was a tremendous reaction to that on the part of other students, including students who belonged to a fraternity who didn't allow Jewish members. In spite of that, they made a lot of protest against the, uh, this measure. And so the next thing we knew that we were out. And then something very surprising happened. The dean of the medical school started a secret medical school. But he couldn't call it the Jewish medical school because it was not supposed to be one. He called it schools for gymnastics and massage. And we went to the homes of Jewish professors and continued with our studies and got credit. Now, I didn't believe when they said we would get credit that we would get it, but we did. And I, when the war was over, I found the credits. They really were there. But in the meantime, the measures against the Jew, Jewish citizens were uh, uh, became tighter and more dangerous. There was curfew. We couldn't go out at night uh, after 6 o'clock until 6 in the morning. Um, we could only go to certain stores. We had 
you couldn't go on the, on the streetcar. Uh, our bicycles were um, uh, taken and our radi uh, ra radios were taken and we had to walk, of course, for uh, food a uh, quite long distance. Um, and so one after another, always with a period of time in between, the noose was getting tighter around our necks. We then had to wear Jewish stars, the Star of David, visible on our coat or shirt. And we had a pass, uh, everybody had to have a, a uh, identity card, an identity card. And the Jewish citizens had an identity card with a big J on it. So as things got tighter and the deportations started, we had, my mother, my brother and I, we had to make some decisions about how far we were going to go without taking some more extreme measures. And <clears throat> we decided that we needed to go into hiding. And the first thing that happened when we decided that was that a friend of mine from high school came to me unsolicited and said, Rhys, uh, I understand you're going into hiding. Uh, um, here is my identity card and I will uh, report my identity card as lost. And of course on his identity card, because he was not Jewish, there was no J on it. So my name was all of a sudden Egon van Blommestein. I was about three or four years older, etc, etc. But the, the crux of the matter was that his picture was in this on this uh, identity card. And a forger and by the way, forgers saved more people's lives than anybody. A forger took his picture out because part of a stamp was on the picture and put my picture in and forged the part of the stamp that was supposed to be on my picture. And indeed, when I went into hiding a few months uh, later, um, I was I took a little walk in darkness after curfew uh, and uh, a German police officer stopped me, shone his f flashlight in my face, asked for my identity card. And I handed it over, I was quite calm. He shone his light on the card and searched it very carefully and then handed it back to me and yelled at me to go on. And I walked away, and after a minute away, I started shaking like a leaf. I was calm while it happened, but when I had the reaction, that was very strong. Um, we went into hiding, and I was in hiding for about two and a half years. I was in different places. I first was in the city of The Hague in different places uh, where as a, uh, somebody who's in hiding and depended on the host uh, had some fun, odd experiences like uh, I was in one place there was also a Jewish girl and uh, the hostess who was a widow uh, said to us uh, a Jew and a louse is a guest in, is a pest in your house. And that was her welcome to us, but she took care of us, but it was uncomfortable and I left there. There's also another part, a story that I'd like to just quickly mention. My mother always fasted on Yom Kippur. And the first Yom Kippur that I was in hiding and the family was spread, my mother was in hiding somewhere, my brother was in hiding somewhere, I took the, the, the uh, streetcar, in a sense, to, from The Hague to Amsterdam. I didn't want to go on the train because it was too dangerous, although I had a false identity card. And I came to Amsterdam to visit with my mother because I knew that was the first time that the family was apart. And uh, I came there, rang the bell, rang the bell, rang the bell, and nobody opened the door. And I had to find a place to sleep, and I went back to The Hague the next day. 
the same way and wondering what the heck was going on. Had something happened? And then I found out that she, they didn't hear the bell ring. So fortunately, that, but it was a very sad evening when I didn't know what had happened to my mother after this whole trip. Uh, <clears throat> worst thing that were to happen. Um, I was in The Hague for about half an hour. Uh, yes, there was one incident in The Hague also where, uh, if you can imagine, there was a friend of mine was giving a party at his home in The Hague, and I was invited to the party. And the party was held in what they call the upper house, which means in The Hague or Amsterdam, two floors with one front door, and then an upper house, two other floors. And they lived on the up in the upper house, so the long stairs going to the third floor. And she had told us, the mother had told us that if we hear the bell ring, um, we should be quiet. And if, they, if she coughed, it meant there was trouble. And we to go to the roof and climb over the roof to the next house. And they, people there knew that this could happen, that uh, to f flee, to, to, to get away from the danger, uh, they had lent their house to, to send and indeed, uh, the next, early the next morning, the bell rang. I listened and I heard a cough and I went to the roof and climbed over to the next house. And the first place I could get in, into that house, I found myself in the bedroom where the, the, the uh, husband and wife were in bed. And there I was all of a sudden standing in the bedroom and I mumbled a thank you and they looked at me because they obviously had forgotten that they had offered this escape route. I went down the stairs to the street and guess who I met there? My friend who had given me the identity card. He was waiting for me. And the two of us walked with the same identity card, the same name, walked together and never were caught. A little luck went a long way. <laughs> I was in Amsterdam for two years, hidden by an old lady who used to be the, uh, the housekeeper of my great aunt. There were four of us in hiding on the third floor of this walk up with her sister, the sister of the lady, Tine, uh, is the lady's name. Her sister with husband and grown-up daughter lived on the fourth floor and they were scared, scared, scared of having four, uh, four Jews in the lower floor, on the lower floor and begged the sister to get rid of us. And the sister, the sister Tina said, they stay, God will take care of us. They stay and we stayed. We stayed there till the end of the war. There are many things to talk about, but one thing that I want to emphasize. First of all, we, had a, we built a hiding place that in case they would come to look for Jews, that we could hide in. We built a second wall in the, mi in the middle room, about a foot from the original wall, and we could get into that space of about six foot long and one foot wide uh, through the back of a closet in the front door, the front uh, room. And uh, fortunately, we never had to use it once we came close to it, but they stopped looking for Jews at our block. We were the last block. I had a radio there because our lady, Tina, had refused to hand in her radio when the Germans required everybody to hand in their regular radios and only listen to cable. That was all doctored Nazi news. But I had this radio and I tried to listen to it, but the sound was very, very low. I could barely make out, although it was in English, it was the London uh, BBC, uh, and I knew English enough to understand it, but I could barely hear it. And by coincidence, there was a wire hanging down from the radio. The radio was on a shelf, and uh, I put the end of the, of the wire in my mouth, and all of a sudden, the sound 
increased and I could hear every word. From then on I had this radio until they cut off the electricity a year later. I could tell people what was really happening and that was God sent because it gave us hope, particularly after the 6th of June 1944 and the invasion of Normandy by the Allies. One thing that kept us going was humor. And I'd like to give you an example. It's sick humor, but it helped us tremendously at the time. This is the story. It didn't really happen, but this is the joke. A Dutch woman walked with her baby, car baby in a baby carriage in a, on a busy street in Amsterdam. And a German officer stopped her and told her that he had a baby in Germany and that he missed the baby and could would she allow him to uh, pick up the baby and hold the baby. Well, she was not in any way motivated to do that for a Nazi, for a German. But she was afraid, so she said, okay, make it fast. He picked up the baby, held the baby, put the baby back and thanked her. And she was relieved to, to try to get away as fast as possible. But he, she had taken a couple of steps and she heard a shot. And she looked where the shot was, had come from. And the German had shot himself and was lying dead on the sidewalk. The next day, the newspapers reported this incident was all over the newspapers. That street where that happened then was so crowded with mothers with baby carriages waiting for Germans. That's the kind of humor that made us feel a little bit less anxious and less worried. There were many other such stories. When you were in hiding there, could you go out of this apartment? I used to, in the beginning, go out a little bit. I had blonded my hair. I was black, uh, dark hair. I blonded my hair to look less Jewish. But after uh, quite a while, particularly with young men, they had razzias, what they call razzias, raids, where they would cordon off a street or a square and check out everybody within that area for identity cards and, and stuff. And uh, uh, then caught, would catch a lot of, of young Jews. And then particularly, and this is a little embarrassing to talk about, the fact was in Holland at that time that only Jewish men were circumcised. And they knew that damn well. And so whenever they suspected you being Jewish, they had took you somewhere you had to undress and looked at you and then that meant you were Jewish and and I know that happened uh, to several people that I knew. So that was a, a real danger. My mother, I should mention, very importantly, was blonde, natural blonde, blue-eyed, so she looked more uh, Aryan than Hitler did. And she was in the street, she did everything because the old lady, particularly when things got tough with food, no food, and then the electricity was cut off, and etc. Uh, my mother really saved the Tina, the, the, like the roles were reversed. She was not afraid, and she was in danger sometimes, but she was not afraid. She was really quite something. And in fact, one of the things that happened, she developed an acute appendicitis. And she was smuggled into a hospital where only the head nurse and the surgeon knew who she was. She was operated on and immediately sent, uh, taken home again because they didn't want her to keep her in the hospital. So these are uh, many more things to talk about, but I've given you. So were there days and months on time that you just stayed in the apartment? Yes, most most of the time that's what I did. And, mo and mo much of the time in the, in the hiding place listening to the radio. English, I knew English enough to, to understand. And so you'd go for days without going inside. I mean, how did you all get along? Oh, wonderful. We did. Uh, and there was a lot of joking, a lot of joking around. Yeah, 
uh, there were four of us, and uh, uh, it was. Who, who were the four? My mother, my great aunt, who was used to be the woman that Tina worked for, and who I knew very well. We visited often, and a friend of the family, a woman also. But I did a lot, of, uh, the way I spent a lot of time, besides the radio, was uh, uh, I studied Russian. Uh, the, the brother of Tine was a Dutch army officer who was imprisoned by the Nazis. And uh, he had a son who was sort of a young teenager who wasn't doing well in school. I tutored him, and he knew... Uh, well, not to talk about the fact that, you know, he knew what was going on. He would visit and I would tutor him. Our friends would come to visit. Uh, but things got tougher and tougher for everybody, particularly when there was no food anymore. Because after September 44, with the Battle of Arnhem and stuff, when the Allies were already uh, closing in on Germany, uh, they, the Germans took all the food, everything. Uh, trains were not running anymore, except, yeah, the deportations had already finished because the Jews were supposed to have been sent to the camps, we, which we didn't know. We didn't know about, about death camps until after the war. But we knew uh, that most of our family had been, including my favorite grandfather, had been uh, sent to the camps. And what did you think happened at the camps at that point? We didn't know. We certainly didn't know. Had an inkling, and it is a puzzle to me, and I talked about it recently, that Anne Frank wrote in her diary about the, the camps and the, the, the killing, the, the gas chambers, the killing, and I have asked so many people in Holland that they know, and nobody knew, and how she knew is a total puzzle, and there is even a question whether her father put that in after the war. So it's a puzzle. But we didn't know except that it was terrible. And uh, so that was uh, how it was. Uh, it's a terrible situation with food. We had no food. And my mother would go, and, and one of the things that happened also, is she, she and the other woman went to a church where they were supposed to hand out potatoes. Well, potatoes were worth their weight in gold. And they had a push cart. And they went to the church, got the potatoes, and on the way back, the push cart got stuck in the tracks of the streetcar, streetcar tracks. And it happened right in front of where the SS, the German police, Nazi police, was housed. There was a man standing on guard. He, put, he saw these two women struggling. He put his run, gun down and came over to help them. And he uh, was able to get out of the tracks. Little, of course, did he know who he was helping. And my mother, in a typical way, said in whatever German, I don't think it was good German, fortunately, said to him, you are standing here freezing your butt off while Hitler is drinking champagne in Berlin. Why don't you quit? And he sort of grinned and left, went back to the guard house and with his rifle, uh, and we got the potatoes. And then on the 4th of May, 1945, and of course my father had no clue anymore whether we were alive or dead or where we were. He was, had made it to the United States. He was in New York by that time, after having been interned for a year in Cuba. Uh, on the 4th of May, I heard on my... I didn't have a regular radio anymore because there was no electricity, so I had a... a a special little radio, I can't remember the name, with a battery, and I could still hear one BBC station, and they announced that the next day the Germans were surrendering. And the next day, a 
was unbelievable. The streets were crowded with people and any red, white and blue, which is the Dutch flag, or orange, which the House of Orange is the royal house, that people could find they were wearing and mobbing, mobbing the streets. And I got out on the street, got a bike, and I wanted to see an Allied soldier before I believed that the day had really come that we were free. And I went from Amsterdam in the direction east to see an Allied soldier. And I got to a town where in the marketplace they were tiring and feathering, a big mob was tiring and feathering two girls who had gone out with Germans. And it was horrible. And I had to get out of the way because they would have trampled me. I was right smack in the middle of it all of a sudden. And I got out of there. And um, I tried to get back to Amsterdam and finally succeeded. And three more days and then the Canadians came. And to see Allied soldiers was a reassurance that something had really changed. I then, my father, who had made it to New York, as I said, asked some of his friends, Dutch friends who were in the Dutch uh, brigade, to find us. And we had moved out of Tina's house and into some rooms, and they found us. And then my father sent us food and clothes, because there was no food, period, no food. Every week, packages with food, some shoes or whatever. And then the sad thing was that uh, we talked to him once on the telephone when the cable, the transatlantic cable was repaired. And uh, on the 6th of June, 1946, he died suddenly of a brain hemorrhage. I mean, never saw him again. And my brother and I then came legally split on a, on a visitor's visa to New York, which was at that time, uh, got, I mean, that you were able to get tickets was because two other people had canceled their tickets because of very few flights. We made it to LaGuardia. And the rest of the story is history. We, have lived in this country, become American citizens. My brother has been quite successful. As a matter of fact, at the age of 85, he has a television show in Haverhill, a local television show. Uh, and uh, I, we've both really uh, adjusted, more than adjusted to this country. And then, of course, Nettie came, and she will tell her own story. I'm Nettie Vanderpoel, and I will not go into the background because my husband already did this. I want to start with my father, all of a sudden, without any of us knowing it, was involved in the underground, helping American pilots who had jumped out of planes to find places for them to hide. There was a traitor in the organization, and my father was put in jail in Scheveningen, a town close to The Hague. On the door of his cell was a Star of David, and he was told that for five days he was not going to get any food. My father was born in Holland, but spent part of his life in Switzerland, and his German was extremely good. The German on the fourth day came back in the cell with food. And my father said to him, what kind of a German are you? You told me five days no food, take the food and get out of here. I just tell you this to give you a little bit of an idea of the kind of person my father was. While my father was in jail, my mother, brother and I were picked up by the Germans and were taken first to a prison in Amsterdam and then to a collection center in Holland where they put the Dutch Jews. From there on, people were sent on to the east. About a week or two weeks later, my father joined us. 
And a couple of days after that, we were sent to Terezin, Theresienstadt in Czechoslovakia. The train in which we were transported was a cattle car. And for three days and two nights, we were in this car till we arrived in the concentration camp. When we got out of there, the Germans were there and we were put in barracks. Most of the Dutch people were put together, but there were a tremendous amount of people. It used, it had been before a garrison for soldiers in Czechoslovakia. Life in Theresienstadt consisted for me, I was forced to work on the land. It was very, very cold. This was in February 45. We were, no, I'm wrong. It was in 40, 44, in February 44. And uh, it was winter, it was very cold there. I was, I had to wear a uniform. I could not wear a coat. I worked out in the land and uh, my, a specialty at this point is getting potatoes out of the soil. That's what I did from seven in the morning till seven at night. Our lunch, a, a big cart came with a large, large bucket with soup that consisted of lukewarm water with a couple of beans in it. And that was lunch. Food was non-existing. When people ask me now, what was the worst part of being in a camp for about a year? It was the cold. It, we were never, never warm. It was cold and, and you felt cold. I mean, even while sleeping on straw mattresses on the floor. I just want to go into one detail about life in a concentration camp. At six o'clock in the morning, there was appell. Everybody had to get there. The Germans inspected you, and then you were sent on to whatever work you were assigned to. One day, I was in a group of 14 girls. One day we passed by what they called the Kleine Festung, which was the penal part of the concentration camp. They made us stand there and look at two inmates who were pulling a plow. The plow was a big round knife. There was a, an inmate in back of it, there was an inmate in front of it, who was pulling it and uh, no that I'm telling it wrong there were two people in front of it but you know with some distance between the two of them in back of it was a German with two shepherds dogs the guy in front fell down the guy in back of him the inmates stopped the German started yelling at him that he had to pull the plow and while we were standing there, the plow went over the guy who was lying down. And it is the kind of thing that I will never forget. It's the face of the guy who had to do this was so horrendous that after the war, I have done needlepoint telling my story of the Holocaust. And I have one needlepoint that I call the plow, and it is in honor of the guy who had to kill his, his mate. <sighs> this was one of the things that was pretty horrible. Um, the working was very tough. There was the second in command of the camp was an Obersturmfuhrer by the name of Heindel, and he was the worst German in the camp. 
what he used to do is he would come on a motorbike inspecting everybody who was working. What he did is he would stop the motorbike about 10 minutes away from where we were working and then would walk towards him. When we heard the motorbike, we would start working very, very hard. When it stopped, people were talking to each other and then all of a sudden he would appear and would start hitting one of the persons who was not working. Life was difficult. My mother was a wreck. I mean, she couldn't cope. And now that I have children, I understand better what it must have been for her to have two children who my brother was 12 and um, his job was he had a little cart that he pushed and on the cart were cart, cart box cart boxes, carton, you know, little boxes with ashes of people who had died. And he had to take that from, you know, wherever it was they had died to another point. This, this was for a 12 year old. That was all he did all day long. After a while, I decided a lot of Dutch people were being transported. And though we did not know about Auschwitz, I felt that I should volunteer to work on the trains, which I did, which was very tough, but I felt that maybe I could help some Dutch people. This one day, the mother of my favorite aunt and her husband, who was a court a judge at the Supreme Court in Holland, and he I think he had Alzheimer's. He was completely out of it. He thought he was going to go to some kind of spa. And uh, he was all dressed up. And I put them in the cattle car and was able to give them a place at the wall of the car so that they would have some support. And I'll never forget, and this is a story that I told when Reese and I, my husband and I, were host and hostess for Facing History, Facing History and Ourselves. This old lady said to me, Nettie, if you survive, tell my daughter, your favorite aunt, that she always has a wonderful, been a wonderful daughter, not to feel guilty because I'm pretty sure I'm not going to come back. And I want you to tell her that she has enriched my life and that she should not feel guilty. To me, this was unbelievable, unbelievable that this woman at this point, knowing that she probably would not come back from where she was going, was thinking of her daughter. And when the war was over and she had three grandsons and when I told, I, it took me two years before I was able to tell my aunt. When I told the grandsons, one of the grandsons said to me, oh, Nettie, come on, she was such a stupid woman. And I will never forget that because to me, this woman portrays what facing history and ourselves stands for. While I was working on the trains, they emptied the old age home and the cattle car that I was assigned to, I had to help people to get in the car. I worked there with a Czech girl. There were six stretchers put aside the cattle car and we had to put these people in the car. She and I took the first stretcher and very carefully went into the cattle car to put this person on the floor. All of a sudden, Heindel, the horrendous German that I mentioned before, came, pushed the Czech girl away, took the head of the stretcher and said to me, from now on, this is the way we're going to do it. He took the stretcher and he turned it around and the woman that was on there fell on the floor. From that moment on, she and I 
he stayed there to make sure that we were doing this, had to do this. And till this day, I feel guilty about what I had to do because the third person who we had to do this to said to me in German, please, please don't do this to me. But I didn't have a choice. I had a choice. If I would not have done it, I would not be sitting here today. And this is the kind of thing because one after the other, they fell on top of each other. I heard bones break. They were crying. They were in pain. And it's so many years later, 60 years later, and I still, when I see people on the stretcher, I still feel this. I still feel guilty about it. And it doesn't help when people come up to you and say, Nettie, you didn't have a choice. It was either you did this or you would have been in the cattle car. That's all true, but I had to do this and that's the kind of thing I live with. You know, we were for about a year in the camp. It, the situation became worse as the years went by. It, the food was minimal. All of a sudden there was, it was made known that the Danish Red Cross was coming to inspect the camp. Till this day, I blame the Red Cross. You may, people may not agree with that. They were absolutely taken by the Germans. They did not take any initiative to go into barracks to see how people were really living. There was a little girl who had been rehearsing with the man in charge, she had to walk up to him, this was a little Jewish girl, to the German in charge and say, Uncle Ram, could I please have a candy, the same kind of candy you gave me yesterday. And the Danish Red Cross went for this hook, line and sinker. They never went into any kind of barrack, into, the, there was a little hospital, nothing. They made a little stand where they had people. They gave them a cello, a violin, and they had them play music. They had a little area where people were giving food, sat outside eating. It is unbelievable. Till this day, I cannot understand that they got away with this, but they did. I was given new shoes because I was able, you know, I didn't have to stay in the barrack. I was able to walk outside. The, before these people came from the Red Cross, they shipped off 35,000 inmates so that the camp would look a little bit better. All of these people were just taken to Auschwitz and Sobibor and most of them were killed obviously, that they got away with it is something I will never understand. After this, the situation got worse and worse and worse. And all of a sudden there was a rumor that 220 people would have a chance to go to Switzerland. You had to volunteer for this. My father volunteered. Most of the people around him told him that he was crazy. We were going to end up in Auschwitz because by this time from the cattle canes, trains that came back, I had found little pieces of paper that the camp where they were taken, you know, most of the people were being killed. The situation was so bad, my father decided that we had to take a chance. As it happened, there was not a cattle car, but there was a regular car. We, 220 of us, were in the car with German soldiers. After three days and two nights, the train stopped. 
The Germans left and we were told that we could take our stars off. Well, you can imagine we pulled off the stars and very, very slowly the train crossed the border into Switzerland. Red Cross nurses in white uniforms came on the train with apples, cigarettes. And I mean, to see somebody in a white uniform with food was unbelievable. And I will never forget that there was a little old man sitting next to my mother. And when the Red Cross nurse came to him and said, Sir, would you like an apple or a cigarette? He said, don't you have any cigars? I only smoke cigars. He was four minutes in freedom and he fell back in his usual thing. And there's something about that. My mother was appalled. But the more I think about it, the more I understand that, you know, sometimes it doesn't take very long to fall back into, you know, your usual kind of approach to life. It's something you live with. There were only 11 families in Holland who came back intact as a family, and we were one of them. A lot of this I have to thank my father for. My father was, I don't know how to, to tell you about him, but I was 18 times I was on transport to go to Auschwitz. My father was able to get me out every single time. After we were in the barracks in Terezin, we got a room where we slept on the straw mattresses on the floor, but we were together, the four of us. And my mother used to sleep on my mattress because I was the one who worked the latest and I was, because I worked outside. So that when I came home, you know, my mattress was a little warm. A typical motherly kind of thing to do, even though she, she was, a mess. I mean, she was crying all the time. And I think that thanks to my father in big part, we survived and it's something to be very thankful for. And all I can say is that at this point in my life, I'm married, I have children, I have grandchildren, and I am so appreciative every day of my life that I see my kids, my grandchildren. I'm thankful that I'm still around. I came to the United States in 1946 and I had met Nettie three times in Holland at three parties, never alone, but some chemistry had spontaneously erupted, <laughs> so we had some feeling, but then my father died, and my brother and I came to the split to New York. I, we kept up some uh, 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 correspondence. But in 1948, Nettie let me know that she was coming to New York with her parents, and I was in Boston. And I want to make sure that I would be free for the weekend to meet Nettie again at my mother's home. My mother had also moved to the United States, to New York. And uh, indeed, I flew from Boston at that time to New York and Nettie came over. We were going to go out on the town with my brother and his girlfriend and the two of us. But there was a terrible snow blizzard in New York City, so we couldn't go out. And we stayed home at my mother's home. And that night, Nettie and I got engaged. And Nettie called her mother the next day and said, I'm engaged. And her mother, who was in a hotel in New York City, in, in, in Manhattan, said, to whom? <laughs> and Nettie told her to whom? <laughs> and so uh, they accepted me immediately. And 
we were married secretly and um, Nettie went home, they had to go home to Holland and the reason why we were married uh, immediately is because we wanted to start a married life a year later when I graduated from medical school and she had to leave and get a visa, an immigration visa. And that's exactly what happened. So the wedding took place in 1948 and the, uh, the big Re shindig, the reception. The, the reception took place in New York in 1949. And that's when we started our married life. And we are now married 62 plus years and still together and still talking. And still talking to each other, yeah. which is pretty good. And your other question is, um, that initially, you know, I had horrible dreams. And I have to say that being married to a wonderful man, plus him being a psychiatrist, was extremely helpful because there were nights that we just walked together and Reese just let me, you know, spill it all out. And uh, that was extremely helpful. And I also know that some of the other girls that were in my group who did not have that, at the group of 14 girls, I know of three who committed suicide because they could not form any kind of relationships. For me, I will not judge people so fast as I hear so many people do because you do not know what people have had to deal with. And the other thing is, enjoy life. Make something of your life. Live every day and try to really live it in, in a positive way. You know, as I said before, for me, looking at my children and grandchildren and that we're still together is such a gift and having wonderful friends. I'd just like to add humor. I've said it already. Humor. Keep your sense of humor no matter what. Also in a marital relationship, humor, yeah. very important. Yeah.